Good morning. My name's Gavin. I'll be reading this morning from Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 5, 38 to 42. And if you'd like to follow along in the Pew Bibles, it's on page 678. Otherwise, as you can see, it's up on the screen. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go two miles with them. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Thanks, Gavin. And uh, morning, friends. It's great to have you with us this morning. My name is Nigel. I lead the team here at Christchurch and Ives. Uh, A warm welcome if you have come in with a friend or family member today. We are so glad that you've joined us as we think about the beautiful teachings of Jesus over the next three weeks. But I want to begin this week with a little competition. There is no prize. There's only kudos for you. And feel free to look at someone near you when you work out where I am reading from. And then you can sort of raise your eyebrows and go, why didn't you pick that faster than me? So here, a competition with the person next to you. When you've worked out where I'm reading from, look at the person next to you. All right, here we go. Famous words. Two households, both alike in dignity. In fair Verona, where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. Of course, uh, they are the opening words of Romeo. Romeo and Juliet. That's correct. And can I say, Romeo and Juliet is my absolute favorite Shakespearean play. Uh, Now, I don't know about you, I had to study multiple Shakespeare's at school, but it wasn't until I actually saw the Baz Luhrmann version of Romeo and Juliet uh, in about 2001 uh, that I finally understood how you could have a tragedy and a love story mixed in together. Many of you will remember the story, except for those who have completely blocked high school English out of your mind forever, Uh, but... If you remember, in the shadow of Romeo and Juliet's love and marriage, a Capulet kills a Montague's friend, a Montague then kills a Capulet, and both families sort of like, and it creates this enormous feud between the two families that goes on and on, and the story ducks and dives in and out of this unfathomable love between these two young people from opposing families families that is just absolutely glorious, but it is set in front of incurable intergenerational hate that is driven by the feelings of eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. And eventually it all comes to a grand crescendo. This has been out for 450 years, so here's a spoiler. Uh, But if you haven't heard this before, I am sorry. But Romeo and Juliet both die in the most heart-wrenching and tragic of circumstances. Now, of course, what's actually interesting is that the very beginning of the whole play actually prepares us for this when it says, from forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. And so here's the thing. In the play, death breaks the cycle of revenge and retaliation. Death is the thing that breaks the cycle. There's two warring families, the Montagues and the Capulets, but they're actually reconciled by death. Now, it's worth asking, why is the story of Romeo and Juliet so compelling after almost 450 years? Well, there's the tragic story of love, of course. But more than that, I think it actually exemplifies one of the most common struggles of human existence. And that is family dramas. 
family dramas. Now, we've been around long enough, haven't we? We've been around long enough uh, to either see family drama in our own family, perhaps with the family next door, perhaps in the family of our best friend. I'm sure you and I could sit together with a cup of tea and a piece of cake and for hours recount the family dramas that aren't in our family and then come back the next day and do the ones that are in our family. And it's not just in families, of course. Uh, Many of us have been treated unfairly in workplaces. Uh, Many of us have been treated unfairly by people, even perhaps people have spoken racistly against us for absolutely no reason. Family dramas and life dramas are everywhere and so much about life is unfair. And so the question I want us to grapple with this morning is how should we react when people treat us badly or when things are unfair? Well, Jesus has something beautiful and radical to say in answer to that question and his answer is don't resist an evil person, but rather turn the other cheek. Now, I suspect your reaction to that teaching of Jesus that we heard read before, don't resist an evil person, you might say to yourself, that, that's a radical teaching, yes. Is it beautiful? No. Uh, is it ridiculous? You might say, absolutely. No one would do that. So let's just unpack this together and see beyond the surface to what's actually happening here in Jesus' teaching and why it's actually beautiful. Uh, Well, to begin with, just note that these words of Jesus that we've just had read for us by Gavin are part of a much bigger collection of words. It's part of a whole series of words that Jesus is speaking to his disciples and followers and people who are intrigued in the first century. Sometimes it's called the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus spends a lot of time contrasting the norms of the day in which he was speaking with a grand new vision for life, for the way he expects his disciples to follow him for the way he expects to see the world transformed if people were to follow after him. So he's contrasting the thinking of the day with better thinking, new thinking, with thinking that might actually lead to the betterment of the world. And that's why he begins with, in verse 38, he says, You've heard it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. Now, that sounds pretty brutal, but the clear purpose of this law in the days of Jesus was to both define justice, but also to restrain revenge by limiting and specifying the punishment a wrongdoer could have inflicted upon them. And so, in so doing, it prohibited people from taking the law into their own hands, like the Capulets and the Montagues who, you did this and I did this and you did this and I did this. No, the teaching of the day said, no, there is a limit to justice. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. And once justice was done, the matter was finished. But Jesus here rejects the place of this retaliation. Jesus here rejects the place of actually revenge against someone else, even if it's limited. He rejects the place of personal vengeance. And he says in verse 39, I tell you, do not resist an evil person. Don't set yourself up in hostility against evil. Don't build yourself an army to fight against evil. Don't encamp yourself in in their social media and sort of attack them continually and continually. Even when every fibre of your being wants revenge, Jesus says, don't. Even when every fibre of your being wants to retaliate, Jesus says, don't. I have a fresh vision for you. I have a fresh pathway to deal with injustice and to break the cycle of revenge and retaliation and hurt. And here it is. He says, If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. 
Now, can I say, in classic Jesus form, he's using some hyperbolic language here. These are not literal instructions, perhaps, for how to actually do life and deal with unfairness, but he's painting principles in pictures. So we might understand the depth of what he's trying to say. I mean, just for a moment, imagine if this was precisely what Jesus was calling his followers to do. Essentially, it would be that all his followers everywhere must become destitute punching bags for evil forever. And he's definitely not saying that. Indeed, were you to read the whole story of Jesus' life, you would see that Jesus protects people from violence on numerous occasions. And, And if you read the whole picture of the Bible, you see that it's prudent to see danger and take refuge so Jesus is not saying here become a destitute punching bag for evil not literal instructions on how to deal with life but an illustration of a principle in pictures let's let's unpick it just slowly one by one again verse 39 if anyone slaps you on the right cheek turn to them the other cheek also here, the right cheek slap referred to there, it's specific, isn't it? He actually just says, not just if anyone hits you, it's actually a right cheek slap. He's referring here to a person's attempt to dishonor another by using the back of their hand to actually hit someone. That, that was what was done in Jesus' day. When you wanted to actually assert yourself in power, assert yourself in honor over another person, to demean another person, you would use your right hand and slap them across their right cheek with the back of your hand in order that you could demean them and assert your own honor. And, and so Jesus says here to turn the other cheek is to refuse to therefore retaliate with your own honor. To refuse to retaliate and and to say, no, no, I I will assert my honour against you. It's actually to say, no, here I am, just looking at you in the face, saying, no. I will not be demeaned by you and I'll lay down my desire to assert my own honour. It's not a call to willingly submit to violence, but instead of retaliating, it's a call to lay down our personal desire to be honoured or to retaliate. Again, he goes on, verse 40 in the next verse, if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If someone wants to pursue an injustice in seeking what's not theirs, be kind in giving more than they seek, laying down your desire to have and to hold all of your possessions. In the next one, verse 41, if anyone forces you to go one mile, likely carrying things, holding things, actually helping someone move along by force, go with them two miles. Someone conscripts you to do a job that's not yours. Lay down your desire to get back at them. Lay down your desire to just do your own thing and actually help someone else, giving them twice as much as they need. And then verse 42, give to the one who asks you, Do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Someone begs for some financial provision. Give to them generously. Lay down your desire to hold on to all your things with a tight fist. And so Jesus' point is this. Instead of pursuing personal justice, here's a new vision for how life might work. Lay down your desire for honour. Lay down your desire for retaliation against those who would oppose you. Lay down your desire for vengeance. Lay down your desire to get back at people. Lay down your desire to hold on to things. And when the rubber hits the road, love and kindness are to triumph over vengeance and retaliation. Now, Martin Luther King Jr. is one of the most well-known ministers and political activists in American history. And he said in a 1962 sermon reflecting on this passage, he said, Jesus knew that the old eye-for-an-eye philosophy would end up leaving everybody blind. He did not seek to overcome evil with evil. He overcame evil with good. You see, Luther King could see the beauty in Jesus' words. And my suspicion is that we can as well. Albeit if you're anything like me, you probably have some lingering doubts. You can see how behaving in this way would actually create a world and a society where things were better, but but there is lingering doubts. It's a great vision. 
It's a great ideal, and if it works, it would create a more harmonious world. But the big question that lingers, for me at least, is, is it fair? Is it fair for me to lay down my honour so another can trample on it? Is it fair for me to lay down my desire for personal justice and and wanting to get back at people? Uh, Is it fair? Why would Jesus really suggest unfairness upon unfairness? Well, I think the answer is this. Jesus knows ultimately that God catches up with people. Ultimately, God catches up with people. Now, the God of the universe has not set the world going and then gone on a holiday. Now, the Bible tells us that the God of the universe is intimately involved in the world. He's watching. He's present. He's engaged with our thoughts and actions, our desires and our inactions. It's why Jesus said just a few verses earlier in verse 21 of this same passage of words Jesus is speaking says if you've heard that it was said to the people long ago you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment and then one of Jesus followers later on are commenting I think perhaps on this very same passage and idea he says do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. God will certainly bring everyone who has ever done something wrong to another person Everyone who has enacted revenge upon another person, anyone who's hurt someone else, God will certainly bring anyone who's repaid evil with evil to justice. And perfectly, with absolute clarity. And so speaking personally, it's this very truth that God catches up with people. It's this very truth that has allowed me to be settled in the face of injustice. It's allowed me not to actually want to reach out and retaliate because God catches up with people in the end. But paradoxically, that same reality has also unsettled me. It's unsettled me because, well, while we've been focused on the negative actions of others this morning, it actually makes me look at my own actions. When I read these verses, they make me look at the way I've treated people. When I look at these verses, it makes me ponder, I wonder if I'm someone who's been unfair or responded to evil with evil. I mean, let's be honest, who here has never treated a person unfairly? Who here has never treated a person badly in family or beyond? Indeed, I think the reality is we're all implicated here. We've heard Jesus' words calling us to lay down our desire for honour, but are we not also the ones who have dishonoured? Are we not also people who have taken demanded and pursued you know as much as we might want to be better than the next guy and it's great to sort of compare yourself to someone else and go i'm better than that guy as much as we might want to say i'm better than that guy there's an absolute standard here and i wonder if we honestly look at our own lives whether we might recognize that actually god might want to catch up with us It might even be true that you and I might find ourselves under the same judgment of God. I mean, is there any human anywhere who might be able to say, I've always done what is right, and in these verses, I've always lived at peace. 
Is there anyone anywhere who can say, I've laid down my life instead of pursuing my own honour, instead of pursuing retaliation? Well, I can only think of one person, and that person is the one who said these words in Matthew 5, and that is Jesus. For you see, he didn't just teach these words. Jesus embodied these words. After living a life of love and kindness, Jesus was arrested and tried and sentenced to death because he'd spoken up against the prevailing religious authorities who were oppressing people and misrepresenting God. And and though he could have called upon the power of God or he could have called upon a legion of angels or any other thing to destroy those who were seeking to destroy him, Jesus did not resist evil. And indeed, later in the biography of Jesus, uh, just as his life is about to come to an end, we read this. That the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted it together, a crown of thorns, and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. And after they had mocked him, they took off the robe and and put on his own clothes and then led him away that they might kill him. A Jesus... He turned the other cheek. Jesus, he gave all he had to his accusers. Jesus, he carried his own cross to his execution. Jesus, he gave his whole self to their evil plans. He was hung on a cross and died. He literally did not resist evil. And yet, in what appears to be a tragic injustice, there is beauty. But one of his disciples who stood there watching later wrote this. He said, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. You see, we who rightly deserve the judgment of God find that at the cross, that judgment is taken by Jesus. A Jesus who did not resist evil. Jesus who accepted dishonour. He did all of that, not for himself, but he did that for you. You know, in her 2011 Christmas address, and my family used to always gather around the TV for the Christmas address of the Queen, six o'clock on Christmas night, uh, Queen Elizabeth spoke into this very issue. She said, although we are capable of great acts of kindness... History teaches us that we sometimes need saving from ourselves, from our recklessness and our greed. God sent into the world a unique person, neither a philosopher nor a general, important though they are, but a saviour with the power to forgive. See, into the world God sent a saviour, Jesus, God and yet a man, because we needed saving from our sin. Saving from death, saving from ourselves, saving from the judgment of God that is even upon us. We needed a saviour with the power to forgive and turn aside the judgment of God from us. And that's just what Jesus did for you. And so here is where the true beauty in Jesus' teaching lies. Is that the one who called his followers not to resist evil did not resist evil himself, and he did it for your good. 
The one who calls his followers to turn the other cheek suffered the dishonor of death on the cross, not for his sins, but instead of you and for you and for the things that might bring the judgment of God upon your head. When we look to the cross, we find that God has not set himself up against us, but instead Christ has laid down his life for us. And so just as with the Montagues and the Capulets, they are reconciled in death. So God and you can be reconciled through the death of Jesus. As Jesus bears your sins, heals your wounds, and invites you into eternal life with him. How did God react to us treating him badly? How does God react when we do things that deserve his judgment? Well, his son laid down his life for us in love, offering forgiveness and eternal hope. And today, I'm wondering if this might be an offer that you're ready to accept. You might be someone here today who's been brought along, who's been thinking about the Christian faith for some time, who's been investigating and curious. We're so glad you're here. You might be someone here today who's realised for the first time that you actually might deserve the judgment of God, just like the other guy. And you might have also seen that Jesus accepted the dishonour and injustice of death on a cross for you. So you might be forgiven, so that you might be reconciled with God. You might be ready to turn and trust in him. And if that sounds like you, then the way to do that is simply just by asking God for forgiveness. By praying to him and asking him that this might be a reality for us in our lives. And I'm going to give you a chance to do that using this prayer that's going to come up on the screen. You can take a look at it. In a moment, I'm going to pray. And you might want to pray along with me, with this prayer that just says, I recognize I've not lived at peace with people and I need peace with God. And this might be a moment for you to say, yes, this is where I'm at today. Uh, I'm going to pray this prayer and I'd love uh, for you, if this prayer is right for you today, to pray this with me in your heart and then we can say Amen together. But if this prayer is not right for you today, you might want to pray a prayer that is right for you while we pray together. So let's pray. Uh, Dear God, I know that people have been unfair to me, but I can also see that I've been unfair to others. Please forgive me. Thank you that when we look at the cross, we find that you have not set yourself up against us. Instead, we find that Jesus laid down his life for us. Help me to trust you and live in your wisdom. Amen. Friends, can I say, if you've prayed this prayer today for the first time, that God hears your prayer, he welcomes you in, and in the death of Christ, You are reconciled with him. We'd love to help you take some steps in understanding Jesus more. And Caroline's going to come and share with us how together we might be able to do that.